morning and welcome to worship. Our Bethel series is up and running again and meet on Wednesday afternoons. If you'd like to be a part of it, please contact Stephen at the office. And then on Friday evenings between 5 and 7, our youth group is up and running again. So if you a youth, come and be a part of that and we invite your family members to come and be a part of it. Then our recipe book is in full swing, thanks to Barbara. She's typing out all those recipes that have been handed in. But some have been handed in without names. And we'd like to put pictures alongside of it. And we're not too sure exactly what it looks like. So if you hand it in a recipe without putting your name to it, please contact Stephen and let him know so Barbara can be in touch either for you to arrange your own photo to put with it or she can arrange a photo to put with it. So please let us know who you are and thank you so much for all the submissions that we've got in so far. We really do appreciate it. It's going to be a great recipe book and we look forward to it coming out later this year. Then we are going to go on to our reading for this morning that comes from Matthew 14. Today's reading is from Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They have, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he told the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is such a wonderful story. A story of Jesus' compassion on people. A story of Jesus' power. A story of abundance. But there is a little more to this story than just what we've read today. I'm going to go back a couple of verses to put the story into perspective. And you will see it gets even more exceptional. You would have heard from the start of our reading today that it started with, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So what did Jesus hear that made him want to withdraw? Well, the beginning of this chapter starts off not with Jesus, but with Herod and John. We hear the story of what happened to John, how John had been arrested because he was condemning the fact that Herod divorced his wife, Phasaelus, in order to marry Herod Herodias. After she divorced, his half-brother, Philip. Okay, it sounds a little bit like Days of Our Lives or one of those soapies. But the whole thing was rather scandalous and against the law, especially seeing that women were not allowed to divorce their husbands. Only husbands had that power. Anyway, John rightly spoke up against the scandal of people getting divorced only to marry each other. And for that, he got thrown into prison. And while Herod would have liked to have gotten rid of John altogether, he was afraid of what the people would say, because they considered John to be a prophet. Now Herod had a great big birthday party, and at his birthday party, his now stepdaughter performed this wonderful dance for him. Herod was so overwhelmed by her dance that he stupidly promised her anything her heart desires. Her mother whispered in her ear, and so she asked, for the head of John the Baptist served to her on a platter. Now the king was in a very awkward position because he had made this promise to her in front of all his guests. And so there was nothing really he could do about it other than to grant her a request. And so John's loyal disciples took his body away and buried it. And then they went to tell Jesus the whole story. 
When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Most of us, when we hear of the death of a friend or a family member, will withdraw to process the news and to mourn. In this case, the news is unexpected and the death is utterly senseless. John was beheaded because a pretty girl, manipulated by her mother, turned the head of the king, and because John stood up for what was right. John and Jesus were family. They were colleagues. John was the one who had prepared the way for Jesus' ministry and the one who had baptized him. Jesus, hearing this terrible news, withdraws to a deserted place. Well, at least he tried to. But the price of celebrity status means that you are never alone. You are always in the public eye. The people just wouldn't leave him alone. The people wanted miracles. The people wanted to hear what Jesus had to say, to be near him, to bask in his glory. And they didn't want to wait or to possibly lose him. So while Jesus went by boat to this deserted place, they spied out where he was going. And by the time the boat finally landed, there was a whole crowd gathered to greet him. I'm not sure about you, but if I were trying to process the loss of a friend and family member, the last thing I would want would be to be surrounded by crowds of people all vying for my attention, all wanting something from me. And so what happens next is just so utterly amazing. Jesus, in his state of shock and distress, instead of telling the disciples to get rid of the crowds, has compassion on them and he heals some of them. I'm not one to often quote the Greek or Hebrew, but the word for compassion is just one of my favorite Greek words. It's just such a fun word to say. The word is splanchnizomai. Splanchnizomai. Isn't that fun? It sounds like you're sneezing. It's the Greek word for compassion, but it's also the word for intestines or innards or guts. While we talk about our feeling being in our hearts, for the ancient Near East, the feelings were felt in their innards. While our hearts may beat faster when we are afraid or in love or excited, when we're in love we feel butterflies in our stomach. Or when we're nervous or anxious, we feel like our stomach is all tied up in knots. We talk about gut-wrenching fear or sorrow. We feel it in our guts. So for the ancient Near East peoples, compassion isn't about feeling sorry for someone. It's, a, it's an intense feeling that you feel in your stomach that moves you into acts of kindness and care for other people. This isn't because of obligation or because of ego. This is splanchnizomai. It's deeply felt in your gut and it moves you to action. It comes from a place of connection and care for our fellow human beings. Our great and powerful God who created the vast universe in the midst of dealing with the senseless and tragic death of his cousin and friend felt this gut-wrenching care for these crowds of people who wouldn't even give him a moment's peace to mourn. I don't know about you, but it just makes me love God even more. Our hurting God chooses to take on the cares of others even in the midst of his own pain. It's the same story we see on the cross when Jesus is hanging there in pain and anguish and yet he prays for the forgiveness of those who put him there. This is the God that we serve, a God of compassion, a God of forgiveness, a God who puts others first. In this world, caring for others, putting others first, is seen as a weakness. It's seen as a character flaw. The powerful take what they want and they don't care who they have to trample well to get it. In this world, compassion is a weakness. But our God is not weak. Our God has the power over all things. However, our God chooses to use his power in compassion, not in greed. Our God uses his power not for his own selfish gain, but in service to others. So while Jesus is healing the people brought by these crowds, it's starting to get late and the disciples can see the people are not going to leave on their own. And so they try to persuade Jesus to send them back to their towns so that they could go and get something to eat because there's nothing for them there. You would think 
that this is the ideal opportunity. Jesus now has a legitimate reason to send these people away and he can finally get some peace. He can finally deal with the death of his friend. But no. Jesus tells the disciples to sort something out. And when they tell Jesus, we can't sort anything out, we only have five loaves of bread and two fishes, Jesus tells them to bring it to him. He gets all the people to sit down and he offers a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And then the disciples go and distribute these five loaves and these two fishes to all the people that are sitting there. And just in case you thought there was just a handful of people that were there, Matthew tells us there were 5,000 men there, never mind the women and children who were also there. Those more than 5,000 people were fed and there were 12 baskets left over. Jesus doesn't skimp on his generosity. Just like when he changed the water into wine and it was more than they needed or deserved and the quality was far better than what they started out with. Our God is generous and he's even generous in his times of distress. So this story gives us amazing insight into how, who our God is and just makes us want to love him more. Then what does it say to us about us, his followers? Other than making us feel great about who our God is, what does it teach us about ourselves? The ones who are called to be his likeness in this world. As we bask in the wonder of our compassionate and generous God, it makes us question how we respond to the world around us. Are we so wrapped up in our own needs and wants, our own loss, our own reflections, that we are blind to the needs of the broken, desperate, hurting world all around us? How often do we retreat to our own solitary place and instead of welcoming the world with compassion, banish out of our sight all who come seeking us. The story challenges us, instead of turning inwards, instead of becoming self-absorbed, to turn outwards, to hear the calls of those around us who are seeking healing, seeking help. We're called to follow Jesus' example and have compassion for people to see people with the heart and guts of God and to be moved in our inner being to reach out and to help them. When last did you feel your compassion in your guts for those around you? When last were you moved to help, not out of obligation or because of what you would get out of it, but because you deeply cared? we are really to follow in our God's footsteps, we have to learn to care about people, to listen to their stories, to hear their hurts, and to respond to their needs. Do we too easily, like the disciples, see only the problems, see only the obstacles which hinder us from helping? We only have five loaves and two fishes, what could we possibly do? Or do we trust that our God is powerful and compassionate and generous and if we make ourselves and what we have available to him, he can use us and them to do abundant good, just as he did in the story. A number of weeks ago, you heard Ernie speak about the saying accredited to St. Francis of Assisi, that we are called to preach the word of God every day and if necessary, to use words. And he also reminded us that we are often the only Jesus or Bible that other people will ever meet. And how we treat and interact with people is a reflection of how they will see our God and whether they will be willing to get to know this God of ours. I'm sure you love God. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting through another sermon and enduring it. What the Bible encourages us to do is to live out that love for God, to live it out and to show it to other people. And today's text encourages us to do so, even when we're in a difficult place. And it calls us not just to do the bare minimum, but to be extravagant and generous in our love. Next time you find yourself having a bad day, and you just want to tell everyone to get lost, I hope you will think back to this text. I hope you will remember that Jesus knows what it's like to feel down and to want to just abandon the world. 
But our great and compassionate and generous God chose not to turn his back on the world. And even through his deep pain, he gave of himself and he gave generously to those in need. May this Spanish passage inspire you to reach out to others even through your own pain. And may you be blessed by the joy that comes from helping others. And so let us pray. Loving Jesus, compassionate God, we thank you for this amazing story of your life. We thank you that even though you were in such a difficult, dark, deep place, that even in your mourning, in, even in your sorrow, you chose to care for others. You chose to see their need and to help them. We thank you that we can see so clearly your love and your grace and your compassion for us through this story. And we can see again how generous you are in the way you care for the crowds. We thank you for your word that reflects who you are and tells us again of the wonderful God that we serve. We thank you again for the challenge that you serve us in this text. We who are called to be your followers, that you challenge us to be generous, to be compassionate to this world around us. You challenge us when we become self-absorbed, when we get stuck in our own worries, our own anxieties, our own problems, and we turn inwards instead of outwards. You challenge us again to reach out to others, to care for others, even in our difficult times. We ask Holy Spirit that you will give us the strength courage to do that, that you will help us to trust you, that even when we think we have very little to offer, that very little in your hands is abundance. We ask that you will inspire us to go out into the world, that you will stir up the emotions deep within our guts so that we can't help but have compassion we can't help but reach out and love. We thank you, Lord God, that you don't just tell us how you would like us to live, that you came to show us. And we ask that you will continue to go with us as we go out into the world and try and do the same. In your name we pray.